now, yes, we have the last talk of the day, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Ian Lance Taylor from the Go team, uh, and he's going to be talking, I hope about generics, no. but unfortunately it's not that, so <laughs> I really hope it was generics. So uh, he's going to be speaking about something else which I should know, uh, but I already forgot because I got too confused with almost dying thanks to a drone. <laughs> Uh, the transition to go to, so I'm still expecting to see some generics. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm happy to be here at uh, Gopher Palooza. It's been a great set of talks, um, and uh, thanks for inviting me. And thanks to uh, the organizers, this has been a lot of fun. So my name is uh, Ian Taylor. On the internet, I go by the name Ian Lance Taylor. I work at Google. Um, I uh, joined the Go team at Google in mid-2008, uh, which was before the first public release of Go. So I've been working on Go for some 10 years now. Uh, it's been a great time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And I'm going to talk about where we're going, in particular, the transition to Go 2. So Go was first publicly released in 2009. Uh, in those days, uh, the language and the libraries changed quite regularly. Uh, for each new Go release, we used to have week release, weekly releases. For many of them, existing Go users, we had a few, even from the start, uh, had to rewrite their code pretty much for each new release. And uh, we had a Go Fix program, which helped you write your code automatically. It knew about the changes we were making. Um, here's an example of what Go used to look like, for example. This is about what it looked like about when I joined the Go team in mid-2008. It's just a simple hello world program. So uh, it's not entirely un-Go-like, but it's also not the same as it is today. So it's changed. That's my only point there. In 2012, we announced Go 1. Go 1, we said, was going to be a stable release of the language and the standard libraries. And uh, that was going to give a stable platform for Go users. They no longer had to change their programs with each weekly release. Instead, they could just develop and it would continue to work. We promised that as best as we could, if a program ran on one version of Go, it would run on all later versions of Go. And that's still true today, of course. We're still in the Go 1 world and we still follow the Go 1 compatibility guarantee. It's worth noting that this compatibility was made at the source code level. Uh, we did not say that you could compile a package and then continue to use that package with future releases. We said that you could recompile your package with each new release and it would work as it did before. And there have been a few exceptions over the uh, six years since Go 1, but by and large it's worked pretty well. Most people's Go programs from six years ago still do the same thing that they did today which I think has been a good thing for the community, and I think it's really helped with the growth of Go to provide that stable platform. Last year, however, uh, we decided, the Go team decided, the community decided, it's time to move on. Russ Cox announced at GopherCon last year we were gonna start a Go2 process. For Go2, we'll start considering significant changes to the language, and we'll start considering the possibility of breaking changes. And the same for the libraries. We'll consider significant changes to the standard libraries. And as you all know, or most of you know, there are potential big changes already being discussed. Modules is available as an experiment in Go 1.11. Um, we've already seen a good discussion of that today. We've also talked about generics. We've talked about changes to error handling. And there's been a number of small changes in cleanups that have been proposed. You can look on the issue tracker on GitHub, look for the go-to label, you'll see people's ideas, and uh, the ones that are still open are the ones that are still under consideration for go-to, which isn't to say we're gonna do all of them, we're not gonna do all of them, but we are gonna make changes, we are prepared to change the language. That said, this talk is not about those changes. I'm not gonna talk about generics here, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about any of the other changes. What I want to talk about now is sort of at a lower level. We, talk to, we have to think about, as we talk about these changes, how are we going to do it? How is Go going to move forward? It's fine to say we're going to change the language, but 
Are we just going to do everything at once? What's going to happen to existing programs? How are we going to manage this transition as we move forward from Go 1 to Go 2? So when I think about this question, what I think about is, how did other languages do it? Go is not the first programming language. It's not even the 50th programming language. There's a lot of history we can look at, a lot of past languages, and let's learn from them. Just as we learned from them in the design of the language itself, let's learn from them in the design of the transition of the language. So, looking at other languages as far as how they've made version transitions. Naturally, the first language to look at is C. C is obviously a big inspiration for Go. It's an extremely popular language. Uh, I'm not sure it's the most popular language today anymore, but it's still one of the core languages of the world. It's still widely used. Obviously, the Linux kernel itself is written in C. Many other programs. When C was started around 1970, uh, it it was not the same C that we know today. Um, it had several incompatible language changes in its early years. By about 1978, when the original Kernighan and Ritchie book was published, which is KNRC, at that point, pretty much all compilers had settled down. Even then, there were several different compilers from different organizations. They pretty much all settled down into compiling the same language. Um, and so C carried forward. Then they started a standardization process. and C was first standardized in 1989. That's when they completed the standard meeting with what became called ANSI C, and then in 1990 became called ISO C. The standardization process added a number of new features to the language, some borrowed from C++, uh, some like the wide character support, perhaps not so good, or the multibyte support also. Um, some of the preprocessor changes, I don't know, but anyhow, Many of the features were good. Um, the standardization process did introduce some changes to existing programs. I'm not going to go through this code here. Um, those of you who look at, who know C well, can um, ponder. Uh, the standard changed um, the integral promotion rules from being unsightedness preserving, which they were before the standard, to being value preserving, which is what the standard um, put in. This was actually a breaking change. It, sil it silently broke some code. Code that looked like this silently broke when you switched from the pre-standard version of C to the standard version of C. This was uh, not such a big deal in practice because most people did not understand the integral promotion rules and most people still don't understand that today. So not very many people wrote code like this because they didn't know what was going to happen anyhow. But it's been okay and since the standard C has been completely backward compatible. Uh, any code you wrote to the original uh, standard C from 1989 will still run today. It'll still work the same today. C has continued to evolve, not a lot, but somewhat. Um, they've done it, for example, they've added some new keywords. And the way they add new keywords without breaking any existing code is that the C language reserves a certain set of identifiers and your program is not allowed to use them. Specifically, you're not allowed to use any identifier that begins with an underscore followed by an uppercase letter. And you're also not to allowed to use any identifier that begins with two underscores. So by using that, what they do is they introduce a new keyword using an underscore and a capital letter, which your program's not allowed to use. Then they introduce a new header file, which uses a C preprocessor macro to define that slightly ugly identifier to a more convenient identifier. For example, there's underscore, cap there's underscore capital B OOL is a keyword in modern C. And then there's a header file called stdbool.h. And if you include that header file, it's just basically consists of sharp define bool underscore capital B OOL. So you then get to use bool as a new type in your program. But that can't break any existing code because the existing code wasn't using any underscore capital B identifiers because they were in the reserved namespace, and it wasn't including stdbool.h because that header file didn't exist. So that's an example of how C has been able to continue to evolve without breaking any existing code. C++, another very popular language, probably more popular than C today, widely used um, all across the world. Uh, 
C++ is actually, the story is pretty similar to C. It was first standardized in 1998. Interestingly, again, C++ made a few breaking changes in uh, when they introduced the standardization process. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this. Anyone who's really interested in C++ can figure out what's going on. Um, now, C++ has continued to evolve, and while C has evolved slightly, C++ has actually changed significantly over the years as they've added new concepts like um, move constructors and uh, the library has grown enormously. The standard library that comes with the language has grown enormously as they've added new features. Um, and as C++ has gone from the original C++ 98 to C++ 11, C++ 17, and they're continuing to work on it. C++ has added new keywords to the language. They usually add new keywords by picking unlikely identifiers. Like there's a new keyword called static underscore assert. Uh, now, if you happen to use that as a variable name in your program, if you compile with a new version of C++, your program will fail to compile. It'll get a parse error as it hits that identifier. One of the ways that they avoid problems with that, and this is true of C compilers also, both C and C++ compilers have a dash STD option or dash standard option. You can use the dash STD option to specify the version of the language standard that you want to compile your program in. So you can say this program is a C++ 98 program, or this program is a C++ 11 program. And by using preprocessor macros, they also expose that request into the standard header files. So the header files can also change behavior based on the language standard you've requested. So by and large, C++, like C, has done a very good job of maintaining backward compatibility for programs. Old C++ 98 programs will continue to build and run with modern C++ compilers. And this is true even though, if, as a C++ expert would tell you, and I'm not a C++ expert, a program written in C++ 98, the older version of C++, really looks quite different from a program written in C++ 17. Uh, nonetheless, the language is quite compatible. Next language. I'm going to just mention this more briefly, is Java. Java, again, like C and C++, have a very strict backward compatibility with each new release. Java has a much larger standard library than C or C++. Java does have a process of deprecating uh, features of the standard library. They use a language feature, uh, annotation. They can annotate functions with the at, deprecate, at, at deprecated annotation. And, you know, then the uh, function is theoretically deprecated. And then, um, in principle, they can then remove the library from future releases of Java. I'm not 100% sure whether they've actually ever done that. But uh, they can. And so Java is also very backward compatible. Um, at the source code level. Uh, I'll just briefly mention that Java does have kind of a different issue, which is a kind of a forward compatibility, compatibility issue, because Java programs execute on a virtual machine, uh, the JVM. The JVM uh, bytecodes sort of constrain what the language is able to do as it changes, because the bytecodes are at a much higher level than ordinary machine opcodes. Uh, you can't um, change the language or rather, let me, say, let me say that again. In order to change the language in a way that the bytecodes do not support can require pretty complex changes to the JVM. And historically, the Java language has avoided making those kinds of changes. That's a uh, interesting restriction if you worry about the Java language. It does not apply to Go because, of course, Go compiles to machine code, except for the new WebAssembly port. And, um, you know, therefore Go can do, in principle, anything the machine can do, which is pretty much every, anything. So what have we learned from looking at C, C++, and Java? These are the things that I've learned. Backward compatibility matters. These languages are all successful, and these languages are all backward compatible. 
New keywords are okay, at least sometimes. And the reason they're okay is if you build with, you know, the new version of the language that supports the new keyword, your program won't compile. It's not great, it's not perfect, but it's not like it's gonna trick you. There aren't gonna be any, there isn't, your program isn't gonna mysteriously change to act differently as the C and C++ examples I showed, the pre-standardized ones had the possibility of acting differently. Silent behavior changes are risky, and since standardization, C and C++ and you know, Java for its whole history have avoided them. We don't want a program that works one way in one version of the language to work a different way in another version of the language. It's one thing if it fails to compile, at least then you know you've got a problem even if you don't know what it is. If it compiles and acts differently, you may have a transition problem. And uh, both C and C++ show that it helps to have an option to say uh, which language, which version of the language you're compiling for. These are the lessons I've taken from those languages. Now I'm gonna talk about another language, Perl. So the, so Perl, uh, you know, Perl was a very <laughs> popular language at one time. Sorry, I don't, mean, I don't mean to diss Perl. I've actually written a lot of code in Perl. It's a great language. Um, Perl was a very popular language at one time, and it went up to version five. And then in the year 2000, uh, development began on Perl version six. And uh, the first stable version of Perl six was available in the year 2015, which is to say 15 years later. Perl 6 was intentionally not backward compatible with Perl 5. It was intended to be based on a spec rather than an implementation. The earlier versions of Perl had all been based, I mean, there was exactly one implementation of Perl 1 through Perl 5. It was written originally by Larry Wall. A lot of other people contributed to it. And, uh, you know, if you ran that source code, whatever it did with your program, that was Perl. So for Perl 6, they said, let's try to actually specify what's going on, which in general is a good idea. Um, Perl 6, the process began with a set of change proposals, uh, all ideas of how to change Perl, and then it sort of continued to evolve, and then it really continued to evolve. And uh, 15 years later, it was available. And in the meantime, many of the ideas had migrated back into Perl 5. And, you know, the length of time of that transition, that was a problem for the language. Now, I don't think Perl is nearly as popular today as it used to be. And it's not all the fault of the transition. Um, other languages, PHP, Python, took up a lot of the mind share of Perl. But I do feel that at the time when Perl was at its peak of popularity, they made a decision, for good reasons, to transition to a new and incompatible version, and they lost mind share, which might have happened anyhow. Might not have, hard to say. But I don't think it helped, let's put it that way. Python. Python, an extremely successful language. It's more successful than Go, clearly, more popular. A lot of people use it, um, and it's a great language. In the year 2006, they started the Python 3.0 process, also called Python 3000. Python 3 was first released in 2008, which is to say 10 years ago now. The transition process from Python 2 to Python 3 is still going on. It's winding down. Most people are making it to Python 3. But you know, I work at Google. Google's actually a big Python shop. A lot more Python code at Google than Go. And just, I think it was just two months ago that they said, you know, okay, no more Python 2 code. Your existing Python 2 programs are going to stop running in the next year. So the transition isn't done although it's been 10 years since Python 3 came out. So Python 3 um, was not backward compatible with Python 2. It was pretty similar, but some things changed. The uh, print statement changed. Um, notably, strings were changed to use a Unicode representation. Uh, and Python is often used in conjunction with C. Um, often, you know, your Python code calls out to C for the bits that are really performance sensitive. Uh, the change in the Python string representation meant that if your code passed any strings back and forth between Python and C, which obviously a lot of code does, you had to rewrite your C code. So that made it harder to change to Python 3. Also, 
you, because Python is an interpreted language and it runs inside an interpreter, in the interpreter you were either using the Python 2 interpreter or the Python 3 interpreter, you couldn't have a program which was a mixture of Python 2 and Python 3. You had to pick one or the other. And Python programs, just like programs in any language, use a lot of libraries that are written by other people. Those people are on their own support schedules. If you wanted to move your code to Python 3, you couldn't, you could, obviously you could write to the common subset, but you couldn't actually switch to Python 3 until every library you depended on had switched to Python 3. And so libraries themselves couldn't switch to Python 3 because if they did, they'd break all the people who used them who couldn't yet switch to Python 3 themselves. So libraries were stuck maintaining both Python 2 and Python 3 versions for many years. And some of them are still doing so. So, now I can't see my notes here. Um, so all these issues, actually I had nothing else to say. All these issues have really um, slowed down the transition from Python 2 to Python 3. It's still a su successful transition. It's still a successful language. But it's been slow, and I don't think they anticipated before they started quite how slow it was going to be. So what have we learned from Perl and Python? Compatibility, earlier I said compatibility matters. Compatibility matters a lot if you're gonna transition forward. The lack of compatibility really slows the transition to new language versions. And it's really good if you can link your old libraries and your new libraries together. If that is to say, if you don't have to wait for your old libraries to upgrade to the new version of the language, before you can start using the new version of the language for your code. That's a feature that C and C++ and Java all have, but Perl and Python did not have. So, that was a very brief tour of some popular languages, and there's a lot of other popular languages out there which I am not gonna talk about today. Let's go back to Go now. Go to. How can we apply these lessons to Go? Backward compatibility is really important. We can safely add new language and library features to Go. That's not gonna break any existing code. That's fine. This includes, you know, the big features most people are talking about for Go2. We can add generics, it's not gonna break anybody. We can add new keywords. That is gonna break some people, people who use those keywords for their identifiers, but it's not gonna cause any silent breakage. When old code uses a new keyword and is, I mean that is, uses a keyword, uses an identifier that's a keyword in the new version of the language, uh, and you compile it with the new version of the language, that code will fail to compile. The error will point right at the keyword. It's not the best experience, and I'm sure we can make it better, but, you know, the developer is going to look at it and they'll say, you know, ah, oh, darn it. Um, I've got to rename that identifier to something to get around the problem. And of course, Back in the Go Zero days, we had a Go Fix tool which updated your programs for you. We can provide that too. We can have a Go Fix tool that, I mean, if we introduce any new identifiers, which is not a given, I mean, any new keywords, sorry, which is not a given, we can have a Go Fix tool that goes through and renames all your identifiers that happen to be the same as keywords and uh, carries forward for you. So we can do that. We can also safely remove a few language and library features. Not that we should look to do so, but I want to make clear that it is possible, even though C and C++ have not done so, we can remove them provided that removing them breaks code that uses them. We can't have any silent changes. And provided that the workaround is simple, very simple, and provided that this go fix program could do the change for you if you choose. So all those things, if all those cases are true, it is possible for us to remove features. Now most other languages don't remove features, so this is a risky step. We should only consider doing it for cases that many programs get wrong, and we can only consider doing it, as I've said, um, if removing the feature would break any programs that use the feature. Now why am I going on about this? Why don't we just keep all features? Here's an example of a feature we might want to remove because most people misunderstand it. Um, it turns out that 
Go, since you know the very early days, has had this feature where we can convert a number to a string. And people do use it once in a while. They think, oh, I can convert a number to a string. It's so much easier than calling strconf.i to a or anything. Only it turns out that converting a number to a string actually treats that number as a Unicode code point and returns a string with the UTF-8 representation of that code point, which is occasionally useful but not something most people expect to happen, which is why if this program, if you run it, will print a little smiley face character, and it will not print the string 9786. So, you know, I bring this up at some length as an example of a feature we might want to remove. Now, if we did remove this, we would just remove the ability to convert into string from the language, and most programs wouldn't notice. The programs that do, they would simply change to call the appropriate standard library function, uh, which is more or less udf rune. although uh, that one uses slice byte instead of string, so we would have to adjust that slightly. And we can do even better. Because we use the Go tool to build Go code, the Go tool can know which version of the language it's using to compile your code, obviously. So, I believe we should add a feature to the Go tool that whenever it builds a package, successfully builds a package, it should record, you know, in the go.mod file that we have now as part of the modules experiment, assuming we keep the go.mod file, it should record in there which language version it used to build the package. When someone else does a go get of the package, they'll pull down that go mod file, they'll see which version of the language was used to, to successfully compile the package, and then they will compile the package using that version of the language. Now, to be clear, what I mean is, for example, if you compile your code with Go 1.20, and in Go 1.21 remove this feature, and someone running Go 1.25, you know, years later, does a go get of your code, they'll build your code using the Go 1.25 compiler with a mode saying, use the Go 1.20 version of the language, just as C and C++ compilers have a dash STD option saying which version of the language you want to use to compile the code, we can have an option saying which version of the language we want to use to compile the Go code. We can do even better because we can record that option when we successfully compile it, and we can use it automatically uh, as other people go get the code. So we can continue to, so we can, where appropriate, remove language features without breaking existing programs because our tooling can automatically do the right thing. Which I think is the way to go. Of course, if you do use this and you do want to use new language features, then you're still going to have to fix your code, just to be clear. All I mean to say is you can have old libraries written in old versions of the language, you can link them together with new libraries written in new versions of the language, and everything will work as expected. An important point that uh, other languages have shown. Of course, there's also libraries. For libraries, I think the modules experiment shows us the way forward. Uh, where it seems useful, we can introduce a new version of a package that uh, breaks compatibility with the old version of the package by introducing a v2 of the package. Or if we really get it wrong, we can go on to v3 and so forth. Um, the most important point here is we'll have to ensure that version one and version of two of the package can both be used in the same program. Uh, a classic example here would be the net HTTP package. It's very easy to imagine that we would want a net HTTP v2 but you might have other packages in your program, other libraries that you're using that rely on NetHTTP version one. We have to be able to link all those packages together, some using HTTP version one, some using HTTP version two. They all have to work together in one big happy Go program. And that's not impossible because we only have source code compatibility. So when you uh, you know, if Go 1.20 has HTTP version 2 and you're going to have to recompile all your code with Go 1.20 to work, that means that you're going to be using the Go 1.20 version of HTTP 
version one. So when we release version two, we can ensure that it is interoperable with the go 1.20 version one, perhaps by having them both call some internal package, perhaps even by having the version one code call the version two code. Why not? So it's not going to be easy. It's going to require thought and careful design, but we can move forward to version two of packages um, and uh, continue to have old code work. If we do that, maybe we can have a deprecation plan for version one packages. Maybe we can say, okay, it's been five years, time for that package to go away, or maybe we'll keep it forever. It's hard to know at this point what's gonna be best. Also, uh, it's worth mentioning that using modules may allow us to release patches for packages without having to wait for a new Go release. And we could perhaps move some standard library packages out of the standard library so we don't have to ship them with each new release. They'll still be available via GoGap. So that's our path forward to go to. The most important thing about the transition process is we don't want to break existing programs. That's what we learned from looking at other languages. We want to be compatible. We can add new features. We can perhaps remove a few old features, but we want to minimize that. We can add new packages with a different API. We're going to keep the old API around. The lessons we see from other languages is that the languages that are most successful over the long run do not have breaking changes. There is no C version two. There's no C++ version two. There's just the same C and C++. They keep moving forward, you know, they keep changing. But there's no dramatic change. So with regard to the overall ecosystem, Go2 could be considered harmful. What we're really talking about is not the transition from Go1 to Go2, it's the transition from Go1 to newer, better versions of Go1. Maybe we'll change to version number two at some point as kind of a marketing move. Everything will appear shiny again. It'll be cool. But your old code will keep working. So that's the Go transition. It's an exciting time for Go, I think. But you know what? I've been doing Go for 10 years. It's always been exciting. And it's still that way. So it's been a great conference. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for the great talk, Ian. Um, I wanted to make sure that you all got that pun of go to might be considered harmful. That was a great pun. So, <laughs> yes, that, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, thank you for that pun. That was a very good pun. <laughs> so, uh...